aspects in child language acquisition by Kristen Surrett, who's right here in front, and learning to think in a second language by Man Bailun. Man could not be with us this afternoon, but he sent a video, and then he'll answer questions uh, by Skype later, okay? So um, as you can see, there are two different kind of lines taken with those conferences, so it was a bit hard for me to think of a very unified introduction for those uh, conferences. So the themes addressed this afternoon, so we have language acquisition, first language, second language. We have pragmatic reasoning by Kristen, Kristen, and language and thinking in the framework of um, Slobin's thinking for speaking hypothesis and the pragmatic thing is really yeah so I would I thought I would start with language acquisition first so we heard a lot about pragmatic pra pragmatics this morning but a little less about the processes of you know the processing behind language acquisition so uh, I would like to go through a few definitions with you first so first of all first language what is the first language? And it's not a trick question, so don't think of it too much. So what is the first language? And native language you learn? Yeah, the native language the, that you can yeah, that you can think with it. So the, the first one that the first language you're exposed to in your life, okay? So there you go, okay, we're going there. So is there always only one first language? Not necessarily. No, you could have many languages, okay? Are your first languages or is your first language always the dominant language, the strongest language throughout your life? No, 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 <laughs> that's it? <laughs> no, not necessarily. What, what would be a context in which your first language does not, be, does not remain your dominant language in life, later on in life? What would be a context? If you're moving, immigration, okay? So the majority language where you are is not your first language. So uh, since you're just using the second language, it becomes your dominant language. Okay, good. So what is the second language now? Not a trick question. <laughs> Excuse me? After? Okay. Oh, I like the fact that you said you have to learn. Please note that I'm not making any distinction between acquisition and learning in my talk this afternoon. I use them interchangeably. I'm not thinking acquisition is uh, unconscious and learning is conscious and forceful and so on. Okay, so same thing. Thank you. Okay, so here is a trick question now. So when, so you have a child in a social, her social environment, and that child is exposed to one language. At one point in the life of that child, when you enter another language, are the representations derived considered to be a second language? What is the age? When? Seven, oh, I have seven here, good, okay, thank you. Seven, seven years old, what else? I have people in phonetics in the back there. Seven years old? No? What? Five, okay, <laughs> five? People in phonetics, that would be? Younger, okay. Yeah, quite younger. Okay, so um, just as a rule of thumb, I'm showing you a table, but please know that it's subject of debate. We don't know really. Depending on the framework you work in, people will say, I hate, I know, <laughs> I know, but it's, I have to, you know, truthful, so here. So, okay, so uh, monolingual first language acquisition. This is the work of Annick de Hoover. I really like what she, she does. She's uh, basing her table here on the work of uh, Jürgen Meisel. Do you know him? A German researcher. He's the chief editor of uh, Bilingualism, Language and Cognition, and also he was in that big, big research project in Germany, the CISA project. They looked at how immigrant workers learned German. So they think, it's a rather conservative view, but they think that if you're exposed regularly, and don't ask me what regularly means, uh, uh, to a L1 between 0 and 6, only you're a monolingual speaker. If during zero and six years old, you're regularly exposed to input in two different languages, they will call that bilingual first language acquisition. And according to them, if from birth, you're exposed to one language, and in that window between a year and a half and four and six, you enter another language, this is considered to be early second language acquisition. So it's pretty conservative. I think this is true for phonetics, I'm not too sure if it, this is still true for pragmatics. 
Uh, as we heard this morning, you know, when uh, Craig, and I'm calling you by your first name, I hope it's not a pragmatic failure, but <laughs> uh, when, when Craig was talking about intuitions uh, that are um, the root of inferences, if you start being exposed regularly to a language between a year and a half and four, or a little later on in life, you know, seven years old, I don't think it matters as long as you have a lot, a lot, a lot of exposure in different, different, different contexts, then you can have those, uh, those strong intuitions, okay? Because what you were referring to, I could not have the same inferences in English than you with my French, you know. I'm telling you this because this has incidence um, on what to reasonably expect people to do in a second language, reason, for instance, okay? So, uh, some people think it's, just to come back to your intuitions about language, some people think it's seven, the, the limit, some people, I heard 15 years old, maybe it's too enthusiastic a bit. Um, just one last word also about language acquisition. There is a, a major criticism formulated against uh, the, those age-related language learning studies, saying that they systematically omit talking about adult learners who were successful in learning the second language, so that we know for sure. So. Just so that you know. Okay, so this is for language learning. I'm pointing there, but I should be pointing here. <laughs> Where should I be pointing? Okay, just. <laughs> should I be pointing with my thing? Okay, so if you want to have more information about the distinctions between first language acquisition, second language acquisition, I recommend this book. This is a fabulous. Uh, it, it really highlights uh, differences and similarities, as I just said. So. Now, um, the population, of course, my bias as a researcher is whenever studies in language, I'm always thinking, who are the individuals providing the input? You know, we, thought we had this discussion before with Elizabeth, you know. Uh, so we know this afternoon that we'll be talking about children tested in the majority language, and they're speakers of that majority language, they're not minority, okay? We know also that we'll hear about adults tested in a second language with man's presentation. However, we could also have presentations, but we didn't have the time for that, but children from different majority languages and compare them. We could have had bilingual children tested in Ardell languages, and I know that your recent work is about that, Spanish, English. And another very interesting thing would be to look at, for instance, implicature among heritage language, adult heritage language speakers in their minority language. So a heritage, just for reference, a heritage language is a language brought by immigration to a, a new location. And the, the heritage language speaker is the, the, the individual that was raised in a house where the minority language is spoken. And as you know, the way we speak is function of the quality and the quantity of the input we, and we think, the way we think is function of that. So maybe, you know, for the, the majority language, they would be comparable to the intuitions, but maybe in their minority language, there might be something different. Okay, so I don't think I need this anymore. But <laughs> I was really thinking about our undergraduate students uh, this summer, because we have a few. How many undergraduate students are there in the room? Please raise your hand. Yeah, okay, so I was thinking about you when I, I prepared this slide. So, Okay, just note that there is not a unified definition, and correct me people working in pragmatics, but I don't think there is a unified definition of pragmatics. But from what I gathered from reading, there is more or less you know, a consensus around about how context is used to infer meaning of an utterance about. And inferences are, the pr are produced when we go beyond the available evidence, or the very simple, simple, simple definition. More, but we heard a lot about conversational implicature this morning. Five, uh, 10 minutes? Oh, okay, so, okay. Pragmatic reasoning. I found this definition here to be a satisfying definition for the question that Etienne Arnaud asked about the difference between reasoning and reckoning, but maybe we can talk about that later. I'm not too sure if you would be satisfied. Here I found that pragmatic reasoning is defined as the process of finding the intended meaning of the given. So is it reckoning or? 
So we'll talk about that later. But OK, so this is what I want to uh, talk a little bit more about, be clear about it so far. So man's, man violence pr uh, presentation is about thinking for speaking, uh, uh, and a hypothesis formulated by Jan Slobin as an alternative to linguistic relativity. Okay? So you heard about linguistic relativity before? Okay, so linguistic uh, relativity is often associated with Worf. It's a form of linguistic determinism. In my opinion, in my opinion, sorry, it's a softer version of linguistic determinism. So von Humboldt, for instance, is often uh, cited, quoted, saying things like in his work, you see the dates. Language is the formative organ of thought. Language draws a circle around the people to whom it adheres, so as if you are a prisoner of your language. Worth says something more nuanced and says something like, speaker of different languages observe the world differently. And in second language acquisition, we have people, because this is a question that is very crucial for us, pe people say things like, people speaking different languages have different patterns of thought. Slobin says that, okay, yes, we might have different patterns of thought, but those are different only when we plan for producing language. I'm going to move so that you can see. So language has specific effects on the cognitive processes, but these effects are limited to the process of mentally preparing for speech. And I have two minutes left, <laughs> probably. So using, it's very famous, you often used images, um, had children from different linguistic background, backgrounds describe the picture, and from his description, observation of what the children would say, he concluded that speakers will attend to and verbalize aspects of reality readily encodable in their language, which is a bit different than relativity, linguistic relativity. According to Mann and his, uh, Mann and his colleagues, the difference between linguistic relativity and thinking for speaking is the following one. The crucial difference between LR and TFS is that the former focuses on effects of linguistic structure on nonverbal behavior and conceptual representation, while the latter focuses on effects of linguistic structure on the processes involved in speech production, the conceptualization stage in Levels' terms. And I'm going to finish just with the presentation of Levels' uh, speech production model, that you understand what he means really. Okay, according to Level, this is a very commonly used model for explaining speech production. And um, according to Level, there are two general phases and then articulation. You first conceptualize the message. So you have an intention of communication. This is macro planning. And then you map semantic propositions onto this intention of communication. This is called a preverbal message. That is transferred to the formulator. The formulator is where the preverbal message is encoded morphosyntactically and phonologically to move on to articulation. Note that this was adapted, this, is, this was conceived for first language speech production. This is also used in second language speech production. The but said that conceptualization is non-language specific when you're bilingual. The selection of the language is done in the formulator. Okay? And I would add to that we were talking about self repairs this morning with uh, Jonathan's presentation. And um, Level says that self regulation, the product of self regulation is self repair. Self regulation happens at all the stages of production. And I think that the self repairs that you were talking about this morning were generated at the level of the conceptualizer. And in second language acquisitions, uh, most, most often we have repairs that are at the level of the formulator, like a, a grammar-like type of repairs. At all level, okay. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to just finish with the, I'm going to skip that. Okay, I'm going to give the last word to Worf um, who is associated with linguistic, linguistic relativity. It is not that acquisition, but I think it's that what we're talking about during the summer school. It's related to uh, how we um, 
when we speak one language, we reflect upon problems to be solved, okay? So this is what he wrote in 41, the year he died, and that was just, at, just before the Second World War. And I think it's interesting, and after I'm going to show you a book, I think uh, we should all read. Okay, so I believe that those who, sorry, I believe that those who envision a world speaking only one tongue, whether English, German, Russian, or any other hold a misguided ideal and would do the uh, evolution of the human mind the greatest disservice. Western culture has made through language a provisional analysis of reality and without correctives holds re resolutely sorry, to that analysis as final. The only corrective, uh, correctives lie in all those other tongues which by, in this word I cannot pronounce, thank you, of independent evolution have arrived at a different but equally logical provisional analysis. And um, in terms of research, re we're researchers, eh? There is this uh, book by Claude Agege who talks about the advantages of all of us converging, converging towards one language to do research. Uh, interconnection, but the disadvantage that might, might lie in the fact that we might lose some specificities in our approach to solving problems in research. So I'm just going to leave you with this. Good uh, continuation, and I'm giving the floor to you.